Today we're going to talk about a special kind of ionic compound called a hydrate. Uh, when you think of the term hydrate, you probably think of the term uh, water. Uh, and again, according to uh, Greek etymology, the word hudor means uh, water. So when you're talking about keeping uh, hydrated, you're talking about keeping water in you. Now, what does this have to do with ionic compounds? Well, um, most ionic compounds are simple uh, ones that we uh, modeled before, and they're some manner of alternating crystals. We like to keep it simple most of the time in introductory chemistry classes, uh, where we have something like salt, where we have a positive and a negative, and a positive and a negative, and it's a three-dimensional uh, repeating crystalline structure that ends up something like this. Now, not all of the ionic compounds are simple cubes like this. They make all sorts of uh, different and varied shapes and, uh, and sizes and so forth, but for, for a mental concept, we're just gonna go with this guy here for an ionic crystal. Now, how is a hydrate different than this? The only difference between this and a hydrate is that there are water molecules that are embedded within the structure of what is going on here. And that makes things awfully complicated looking. So this is an example of a copper sulfate hydrate. It's a beautiful blue crystal. And if you try to model this, you're going to get a very different look than what we saw up here with this very simple um, idea of an ionic crystal structure. So what you've got here is you've got these water molecules. Can you see them here? I'll put them in uh, blue because you don't want to. Uh, so there's a water molecule and a water molecule and a water molecule. And within the um, crystalline structure of this guy are the copper and the um, sulfate ions. So there's some copper and some sulfate in there. It really is difficult to be able to tell what is going on with this. So here is another example of what might be occurring at the uh, microscopic level. You've got your copper and you've got your sulfate going on here. Here's your copper ion and here's your sulfate ion. And they are ionically attracted, but embedded within those uh, opposing charges of positive and negative, you've got your water molecules that are there as well. And uh, you'll notice in uh, these cases, the oxygen side, the negative side of water is pointed toward the positive part of the copper. And if we were to draw some water molecules for the uh, sulfate, it would be more like this, where it was H, H, and O, where the positive side of water is attracted to the negative sulfate ions that are over here. And so you embed these water molecules uh, within the ionic crystal here, and <clears throat> it makes an extend, a different kind of an extended crystal uh, structure. Now, there are a couple of terms, and again, these things get very complicated very quickly, uh, but the terms that are uh, important here are the term hydrate and the term anhydrous compound. So the hydrate is the compound that has the water molecules in it. And you'll notice that they've drawn it in kind of a weird way. So this is copper bromide. So you've got the copper bromide part here, and then you've got the water part here. And apparently there are four water molecules for every one combination of the copper bromide that is there. So when they write it out, they don't use brackets. They just use this little dot, or sometimes they use an asterisk or something along those lines, right? But there will be a separation that's there. And the basic idea here is that there is this part and there is this part. And that is considered to be the hydrate because the hydrate contains the water molecules. Now, this is same exact thing without the water molecules, this guy here, this is called the anhydrous. The prefix an meaning without, hydr obviously meaning water, so without water. So this is the copper bromide without the water, this is the copper bromide with the water that's there. So this is the hydrate with the water, this is the anhydrous compound without the water. Now, if you are wondering about this shape here, 
um, how you're supposed to get copper bromide from all of these different things. And you'll notice they've got the cube here. Well, that's why I said these things get really, really complicated. And you'd have to take an advanced chemistry class or really get into uh, the whole idea of ionic structures. And it's just not covered in, in introductory AP chemistry like this. It would be an upper level graduate kind of a class. Or you'd have to have a teacher that's really interested in uh, that aspect of things. But the AP test has decided that that is not an important topic. So I'm not going to get into that. Uh, here's another example. Here is uh, chromium fluoride with nine water. So it's a Nona hydrate uh, there. Man, that is awfully, awfully complicated in there trying to figure out where all those waters are and how they are all arranged and so forth. Uh, but the empirical idea here for this compound, this is again the hydrate. You've got this guy here and then you've got that guy there. So that is the hydrate. If you make it the anhydrous compound, then that means you are taking out these waters. And if you take out the waters, you get a very different compound here. So this is just the chromium fluoride without the waters uh, in there. So this is the hydrate with the waters. This is the anhydrous compound without the waters. So this is anhydrous. And when you go from hydrate to anhydrous or back and forth, uh, you'll notice that these crystal shapes take on a very different look. So this guy here is more of a rectangle or a cube. This guy here is more of a slanted uh, compound. Like maybe that's a rhombus or something. I don't know. Um, but uh, quite oftentimes, those different shapes and those different arrangements can lead to uh, very different looks. So remember that copper sulfate that we started with way back up here, that pretty blue crystal? Well, that's the hydrate. It's got the waters embedded within it. If you heat this up, right? So here is the hydrate. And again, you'll notice here that the water molecules are still embedded in this, which is why it's the hydrate. But if you heat this guy, then you can shake those waters out of there. So you can heat it up to the point that the water molecules leave and if they leave then what you've got is you've got the anhydrous compound so here is the copper sulfate without the water and you'll notice it looks very very different it just kind of looks like a white powder whereas this guy here is that pretty blue crystal so this is either a white or an extremely light blue uh, powder going on here so the two things look extremely different one with the waters embedded within the crystal and one without the waters um, uh, embedded within that crystal because the waters have been kicked out of that compound. So what you'll often see is you will see uh, problems that tell you the mass of the hydrate and the mass of the anhydrous compound. And from that, you can be able to figure out what the formula is because again, the hydrate looks like this and the anhydrous compound looks like this. Um, one of them has the water, all right? And then one of them doesn't have the water. Now to solve these problems, I want you to go ahead and look at the next um, uh, section, which is the sample problems. But basically what you're going to do is you're going to do the same thing that we did in the previous section. So if you have, you know, MZ and we wanted to know what X and Y were, we wanted to know what the moles were here and we wanted to know what the moles were here. In a hydrate, we're going to do the exact same thing, except you're going to have two different bracketed sections you're going to have the mz section in and of itself and you're going to need to know what the moles are here and then you're going to have the water section and you're going to need to know what the moles are there so you're going to have some ionic compound mz so again this is some ionic compound i can spell ionic compound and then you're going to have a star or a dot or whatever and then there's going to be XH2O. And so this is going to be the water that's there. And so what you're going to do is you're going to break this up into, again, the MZ part for moles and the water part for moles. And you're going to figure out what the ratio is between them based upon the data and the context clues that they give you.